thank you, worship team, Isaac and our tech team leading us every week. We're in the book of Acts, and today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 3, so if you have a Bible or you can pull it up on your device, it'll also be on the screen. Acts chapter 3, we've been talking about the church, the birth of the church, the movement of the church, the church, very messy. Why is the church messy? Because it's full of people, <laughs> broken people. Boulder Mountain, if you were perfect before I came, I'm sorry you're no longer perfect <laughs> because I am not. And a church, the myth of the outside world, myth is that we're, we somehow claim to be perfect. It's actually the opposite. We recognize our brokenness and our need and our dependence upon Jesus. And we, we're looking at the birth of the church, the early stages of the church. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 3 today. Peter and John, disciples of Jesus, spent three years with Jesus. Now, Jesus was their leader uh, on earth. They, they literally followed him. And Jesus, he's not just brilliant. He's a brilliant leader, the greatest leader that the world has ever known. And so he led these 12. What did he do with the 12? He, he said, hey, watch me. I'm going to lead and you're going to watch. He did that for a while. Some of us who lead people, that's what we do. Hey, watch me. I'm going to show you. So Jesus did that. And after a while, he said, I, I'm going to do it. Now you're going to help me. I'm going to feed the people, but you're going to go get the food. You're going to collect the food. You're going to get the food. You're going to find the food. You're going to help me. And then after a while, a little while longer, Jesus flips and he's like, you're going to do it. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to help you. Now, now you go do it. And that's where we find in Luke 9, Jesus sends out the 12. Like you're, you're going to go. And then the final step of his great, brilliant leadership was now you're going to go. You're going to do everything I've been doing, and I'm going to leave you. Right? It's good leadership. He, he modeled for him. He was an example to him. He helped them. He watched me. And then eventually he says, I'm leaving. I'm going to give you everything you need, though. I'm going to equip you. Ever had a boss who told you to go do something and didn't give you the tools to do it? That's not Jesus. He says, I'm going to give you the tool that you need. The tool, the greatest tool ever, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a helper, and you're going to do more. You're going to accomplish more, Jesus says, than I did my three years here. You're going to do more. That's, that truth kind of blows my mind when you think about that. Jesus saying, I'm leaving. You're going to do more with the Holy Spirit than if I were to stay present with you. That's where we find ourselves, the beginning stages of the church. Peter and John. Jesus often would send them out two by two. Don't do ministry by yourself. Jesus says, two by two. He sends them out in Luke chapter 9. He actually tells them, don't bring any money with you. You're going to meet needs of every person you come in contact with, but I don't want you to bring any money. Leave that all behind. I talked on a devotional this week. Uh, we have a weekly devotional that some of our folks do. It's on YouTube under Boulder Mountain. I talked about the difference between an adventure. I love adventures. If there's an adventure, I'll sign up for it. I'll figure out everything else later. That's been my experience. Oh, there's a, I'll sign me up, and then I'll figure the details out later. I love adventures. But you know about adventures, you come home from an adventure. You go, you do it, and you come home. Following Jesus is not an adventure. Are there adventurous moments? Yes. Following Jesus is a quest. You don't come back from a quest. When you follow Jesus, you, you don't go back to your old way ever. You, you are changed forever. We're reminded of Lord of the Rings. Eventually they get to where they're, they're going, the, the celestial city. Now I'm Narnia. But you're tracking with me, right? There's, there's a day where, where, where are we heading for? The great celestial. No, that's Pilgrim's Progress. All great, great writings and stories. If you've given your life to Jesus, you're not on an adventure. You're on a quest. You don't come back from that. You're forever changed. Peter and John are now forever changed. They get it. You, 
And this is important because you can't give what you don't have. You can't be sent off into ministry if it hasn't captured your heart first. Peter and John, it didn't capture their heart before the cross. It didn't capture their heart at the cross. They were ready to go back home on their adventure. That was a three-year adventure. I don't know what that was, but let's go back to fishing. That's where they were after three years. It wasn't until the resurrection, then their adventure became a quest, and it forever changed them, and it forever changed us. The resurrection changes everything. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, we find Peter and John. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. They were Jews. Even though the church age had started, if you were to ask them, hey, are you still Jewish? Absolutely, we're still Jewish. What are you talking about? Why are you even asking me this question? We still go to the temple. We still do, did a lot of the same customs. They didn't sacrifice anymore. They didn't do that. They didn't need to sacrifice animals anymore. But they, still, they were still Jews. They went to the temple. Verse 1, they went to the temple of prayer. When? At the ninth hour. Now, I don't know if Luke, when he's writing this, was intentional with that moment in time. But when we hear the ninth hour, we think of the most significant moment in the history of the world. It's when Jesus paid the price for all sins, for all mankind, for eternity. We breathed his last it was about the ninth hour, it says. Darkness filled the earth. The veil was torn in two. Jesus breathed his last. This is the moment in time. I wonder if Luke, when he was writing, had that in mind. And we have that in mind. The ninth hour, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour. It's the moment Jesus paid the price for your sin and my sin. It removed the shame and the guilt from my life and gave us freedom. That's the moment. They're walking into the temple, Peter and John. Verse 2, and a man lame from birth was being carried. All right, let's pause. A man, we don't know his name. We don't know his name. I don't know if Peter and John ever knew his name. But he's lame from birth. He didn't experience an accident in life. He never was able to walk. He, he never took a step. So I think about the, his birth, right? He's, they're there, and she's giving birth. Mom's giving birth, and they're, is it a boy? Is it a girl? They didn't have gender reveals back then. They didn't, right? They didn't have, sonic, they, they didn't know. Their great anticipation, is this a boy? Is this a girl? It's a boy, but, it's a boy, but he's crippled. There's something wrong. There's something broken with this, with this baby, he can't walk. He's never walked. He's never skipped. He's never leaped. He's never jumped. He's never danced his entire life. We don't know if he's 15, 20, or 80. We don't know. All we have is what the text tells us. But we do know that he was being carried to the gate. We knew that he had some friendships. Could have been his family that would carry him and lay him down at the gate. Do you have somebody to pick you up and carry you? Do you have that type of friendship when your, your greatest need, you would have somebody put you on their back? We think of this, and I, I'm going to challenge all of us as we read this text, not just think physically. We, we read this and we think, oh, his greatest physical need is he can't walk. I, I want you and I to view this text with the spiritual brokenness that, that we all have had at one point. The spiritual brokenness, the spiritual death, right? The first point, if you're taking notes today, we are all born into sin, spiritually helpless, unable to save ourselves. There is nothing this man could do to save himself. He, he, could, he couldn't even get himself. He couldn't move Right? The same is true for us spiritually. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. You can come to church every day. The door is open. You can give everything you have. You can be in every small group, every ministry, every program. You can be a part of everything. It will not save you. Your works play zero part in being saved. You are dependent upon somebody else to pick you up and carry you. 
Spiritually speaking, the person who picks you up is the person work of Jesus. Jesus saves us. Jesus saves us. This, this summer was rough on my plants in my yard. I don't know if you lost any plants. It was so hot. I think it was the worst summer we've had in 10 years. that We've lived here anyway. Last Christmas, we had some pine trees outside on our driveway, and they looked pretty. We put lights on them, and then Christmas ended, right? And I don't want, I don't want to throw these away. So you know what I did? I, I waited too long, but I eventually planted them in my yard. I'm going to plant these nice pine trees because pines are native to the desert, right? <laughs> no. And I watered them every day. We, we took good care of them. We did everything we could. We started seeing some brown on them. Like, it's okay. I'm going to water them more from fertilizer. Really take care of, make sure there's some good, moist, black soil there. Talked to a landscaper later. This is the tree last week. I eventually dug it out, and we got rid of it. It's in my dumpster right now. But the landscaper, you know what he told me? He's like, he was probably dead when you planted it. And I'm thinking, I'm just trying to birth this thing back to give it a little, it needs a little more water, a little fertilizer, a little this and that. It was dead when it was planted. This didn't need miracle grow. It needed a miracle. Some of us don't need to do something else. We need a miracle in our life that does not start with you. It does not originate with you. It does, it's not something you can do. Only the power of supernatural power and authority of Jesus can resurrect that tree back to life. And the same is true for you and I. It is only Jesus that can save. It is only Jesus that can bring this person, this lame man, to walk. He laid at the gate Daily, he laid at the gate of the temple. That's called the beautiful gate. Isn't that incredible? The gate's name is beautiful. Now, the beautiful gate, Solomon's Port. So it was on Solomon's Port, 75 feet tall. I have a little gate in my backyard. It's about six feet tall. 75 feet tall. Imagine that. He never walked through that gate. Wasn't allowed to walk through that gate. The best he could do is, hey, Make sure you just lay me right before the gate. It was covered in gold. It was on the east side. It was facing east, so it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It, had a, had, it was a porch. There was a covering over it. But either way, there was shade. I don't know if he was moved from the west side where he was in the morning, and then he was brought over to the east side to make sure he stayed out of the sun. But he laid there. There's different courts at the temple. The temple, original temple was destroyed, but was resurrected again by the Roman Empire and Herod, and they did some, went under a remodeling. But Solomon's ports stayed there. There's different courts, right? They had the court of women. You had the court of Israel, which was really the court of, of men. You had the court of Gentiles. The court of Gentiles was the farthest outside court. And he was laying at court of Israel, and the religious leaders would, would walk by into the temple, and they would give to those who were begging. You did not walk by without giving, because that was a sign of righteousness. Jesus calls them out for it, because their motive was improper, but everybody gave something. Today, those of us going to Israel next year, there's an opportunity to still sign up until January, you will see that to to this day, nobody walks by without giving a beg or something. You just don't do that. It wouldn't look good. And so he goes, and he knows that. Now, this man had bills to pay. Right? He couldn't work. He had a legitimate reason he couldn't work. He couldn't earn the wages in order to pay his bills. And so he's at the mercy of others to give to him. Alms, it says here in Scripture, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter, verse, verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Eye-to-eye -eye contact. 
It's a missing art in our culture, isn't it? Eye contact is so important. Do we, for those married in the room, do you have moments where you're eye to eye, knee to knee? It's really important to have those times, especially when you're asking for a request from somebody. Now, we've all been there. We were reading this 2,000 years ago, but it's still true to this day. You ever pull up to an intersection at the light and there's somebody asking for help, holding a cardboard sign? What's the one rule? Don't make eye contact. I'm going to change the radio station. I'm going to look down. I'm going to play, you know, eyes straight forward. You don't make eye contact. The same is true at the gate. Don't make eye contact. Because if you make eye contact with, then they think that you're, going to, you're going to give them some money. By the way, a little side note. Uh, as a church, as a church, but also as individuals of Boulder Mountain Church, as we go throughout our week, say yes as often as you can with wisdom. So we should never, never say no completely to someone. Some volunteers recently, based on your generosity of food that you bring into the church, have made little bags like this. They're non-perishable bags that you could keep in your car. It says Boulder Mountain Church. There's some information in there, but some food. Keep these in your car. And so next time you pull up to a light and somebody's asking for food, you can, you can give them a bag of food. It's always right to give somebody food. Why would we not give somebody food if they're hungry or thirsty? That's, I mean, that's what we're, we're told to do. So I don't know if there's still bags. There were some bags left after the first service, but we'll make more. And so those will always be available. Anybody who ever comes to the church asking for we'll always give them something. We may not give them what they want but we'll always give them something. We want to be a church of, of yes. Peter and John say, hey, look at us. And so probably the lame man, and we don't know his name. He's sitting there at the gate, and he's probably thinking, yes, all right. This is a win. I'm going to score with these guys. I made eye contact with them. What do you have for me? And listen to what... What Peter says, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Take moments. Don't overlook people. Don't overlook people in your life. We, we get so busy. We're running from the store to the coffee to work to this and that. Man, every person has value. Every person has infinite value and worth. Every person you're going to come in contact with this week. We may not know their name. God knows their name. God knows their story. I have no idea why they are where they are. God knows them. He loves them. He cares for them. See, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Oh, what do you have for me? He's asking for alms. Isn't it interesting? We often ask for what is not our greatest need. What was his greatest need? Was it food? No. He couldn't walk. As a church, sometimes we ask for things that are going to happen anyway. What, what if we, as a church, prayed bold prayers? Prayed, prayed prayers that are not going to happen anyway. What, what if we prayed a prayer that was impossible for man to answer? And I'm just going to challenge us. We, we all pray for health issues. 99% of prayer requests in the church are health-related. Keep praying for health-related issues. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Keep praying for health-related issues. God heals. God can heal. Pray. But what if we added some other things to pray for? Pray for the lost. Pray for our, those in government positions. Pray for supernatural acts to happen in the lives of other people. What if we added some of those prayer requests? Let's not just pray for things that are going to happen naturally. Let's pray for impossible things. Let's pray for that tree to be resurrected back to life. I can't do that. There are people in our life I can't save, and you can't save. Only the power and the authority of Jesus can bring them back to life. That's it. And Peter says to him, but Peter said, this is so powerful, highlight, underscore it, Take a colored mark or whatever you need to do. I have no silver and gold. I know that's what you want. To the world outside the church, I know you think you need this and this and this and this. I don't have that. 
But your greatest need is not silver and is not gold. Now he's standing in front of an arch that's full of gold. The context, there's gold all around him. I don't have that for you. But what I do have is the greatest gift that you will ever hear about. What I do have to give you, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Peter didn't heal this man. Spoiler alert. It's going to get healed. Peter didn't heal him. John didn't heal him. Mankind does not heal. No man, woman heals. The name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus brings healing to people. Peter says, I have no silver or gold. What I do have, I, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Now, I don't think he said rise up and walk, crossing his fingers. Oh, I hope this works. I think the Holy Spirit prompted him that he was already healed. That when he's speaking, when he's looking at him, the Holy Spirit said to him, I've healed this man. Tell him to get up and walk. And he says, I, I tell you, I command you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Now, the, remember, he's never taken a step in his life. And I wonder, how long did that take? Was he sarcastic? Did he doubt? Was he like, yeah, right. Good one. Now, give me something. And he took him by the right hand. He wasn't afraid to touch him. He reached out to him by his right hand and raised him up. Immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And what does he do in verse 8? And leaping up, he goes from a lame sinner to a leaping saint in a second. In a second. What did he do? He didn't do anything. His healing was simply something he received in the name of Jesus. He didn't have to work for it. He didn't have to earn for it. Leaping and walking and praising God. When it comes to miracles, it's not about the miracle. It's not about the sign. It's about the one who provided the miracle. It's not just about the miraculous. We're all awe and wonder over the miraculous. We should be more awe and wonder over the one who caused the miracle and brought healing to this man. This man didn't even know what to ask for. Isn't that true for most of us? Most of the time, I don't even know what I need. I think I do. Is that true for you? We don't even know what we need, and yet God meets our needs in different ways than we ever thought possible. And all the people saw him walk in, praising God, and said, Who's, is, that guy looks familiar. We've never seen him eye to eye. We've always been looking down on him. Is that the guy? And all the people saw him walking, praising God, recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. How did the church grow early on? The word got out. This person, something happened. Something happened with this person. The testimony of the followers of Jesus began to spread. What? What happened? You're not who you thought you were. Anybody can relate? That's not who you used to be. What has happened to you? Who have you met? Who have you talked to? Where are you going to counseling? There's something different about you. And the difference is Jesus is the difference. Jesus saves. The hope of the world, the hope of the world is the local churches that preach Jesus. Not as it preaches politics, not as it preaches work harder, do better, Rules and laws and all this other. The hope of the world is the local church as we preach the gospel. The solution for homelessness in the world today is Jesus presented through the local church. The hope of suicide, the problem of suicide, every 42 seconds somebody's taking their life. The hope for that is Jesus as the church preaches the gospel. Marriage problems, marriage conflicts, financial debt, you name it. The problems that you have today, there's nothing that you significantly can do by yourself to bring healing in that. Brokenness, we, we, brokenness, we all have it. We find healing through the person and the power of Jesus, the resurrection power of Jesus. There's a difference some of us have prodigal children. Prodigal, it's not parents do more and work harder and say more and direct and counsel more. No, Jesus is going to 
Jesus is going to work on that, that person. The hope of the world is Jesus. And there are people all around us in our community, we don't know their name. They don't even know what they're asking for. They don't know what their greatest need is. There are people who tell me, I'm sick of being invisible. I don't want to be invisible anymore. I want to be known. Silver and gold we don't have. We have something far greater. And I love that it's at the gate of beautiful. The most beautiful thing in your life is your relationship with Jesus. Can you say that? Jesus is the most beautiful thing in your life. And wherever you are right now, whatever age you're at, however many more days you have left of your life, the most joyful ending of your life includes Jesus. However you want to play out the rest of your life, you want the happiest, most joyful, peace-filled ending of your life, it, it should include Jesus. Without him, it will not be, it will not be any of those things. You may not ever get silver and gold. We don't have that to give. We have something far greater. In the name of Jesus, you can find healing today. Now, I, I told you, we're not talking about physical healing. I want to just zero in on spiritual healing today for a second. What the world offers a broken world, what, what the church offers a broken world, is eternal healing. In the name of Jesus. It's, it's the gospel. As a church, if you take your program, if you have it on the front cover, it's our mission as a church. You're going to hear this a lot. And if you don't have it memorized, you'll, you'll work on it. You'll hear it so often that it'll, you'll just recite it. As a church, we make disciples. Why do we make disciples? Because Jesus tells us to make disciples. It's, just, it's always a good answer, right? Because Jesus tells us to make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple all-in follower of Jesus. A disciple is an all-in follower of Jesus. All-in. Are you a disciple of Jesus? All-in. Between you and God, you can, you can answer that. Am I an all-in follower of Jesus? We make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. Now, the two components of that, find. There are people in our community who do not know Jesus. There are people in our community, in our world, who've never heard good news from the church. They've heard news. They've heard bad news. They've never heard good news for their life. What an opportunity we have. The 361 million people in our nation. Right now, we have the least, we, we've seen the greatest shift in church attendance in the history of America. The other great shift was the Great Awakenings, one and two. You see, there's this myth that the early United States was everybody went to church. Only 17% of the colonies' population went to church. The high water mark for Christianity in the United States was actually mid 20th century, World War II era, right? The, the greatest shift prior to the last 25 years was combining the Great Awakenings and everyone who was ever saved at a Billy Graham crusade. My mom was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Add all of that, the greatest shift, right? Well, we've doubled that in the opposite direction in the last 25 years. Millions of people never, been, never have heard good news. 40 million people are now in America are de-churched, meaning what they heard did not capture their heart like it did with Peter and John. What they heard didn't capture their heart. They, were not, they did not go on a quest. It was a little bit of an adventure, and then they, they left it. The number one reason why 40 million people have left the church, number one reason, you know why? Because they moved. We moved. We just never found a church. 25% of those, there was significant hurt, significant abuse in the church. And they've walked away. That's a, that's a real reason. Maybe for some of us, that, that was a reason. Our church experience was so poor and so negative, and by God's grace, you're back. I'm so glad. But most of the de-churched people, you know what they're waiting for? A simple invitation back. COVID, big, big reason a lot of people stopped attending church. They realized, oh, I kind of like having a whole day myself, right? Let's invite them back. Unchurched, never heard the good news of Jesus. They don't know a 
they can ask for more than alms. They can, they can ask for complete healing in the name of Jesus to address our greatest spiritual need, which is what are we going to do with sin? And Jesus answered that. Jesus paid that price. If you're taking notes, the power of Jesus heals broken people in an incredible fashion. Oh, those of us who know Jesus, we could all share our stories. All of them are incredible fashion. No one story is greater than another because it took the same amount of grace to save all of us in this room. Jesus, the power of Jesus heals broken people in an incredible fashion. The healing power of Jesus is far more valuable than anything we could ever imagine. I, I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what, you're, what you think is your greatest need. Your greatest need is forgiveness of your sin. Resurrection power of Jesus in your life. That all took place in the ninth hour. The final note there in your notes, it's a question. First, have you been to beautiful? Have you been overwhelmed by the magnificence of Christ? We sang about it. Christ be magnified. The most beautiful thing in your life is Jesus. Have you been captured by that? Have you met him? Have you been to the gate? Did you reach out? Did you get up and experience things you've never experienced before? If you haven't, today can be that day. You can meet Jesus here today. He loves you. He knows your name. He's forgiven you of your sin. He wants to remove guilt and shame regardless of what you've done, where you've been. Jesus loves you. And we want to help you find Jesus. For those of us who have found Jesus, are we following him? Have you gone on the quest? Have you left everything else behind? Or are there some things you're still holding on to? As a church, we make disciples to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we're going to do. 6,000 churches closed last year in, in America. It's a lot of churches. The second that we stop thinking of the people who are not here is the second we might as well lock our doors closed and go home. It's going to take, take some change. I'm so grateful for the church that's gone on this journey with us. This past year, there's been a lot of change. I know. I'm feeling it. Right? And just when I want to get comfortable, right, we're going to keep everything the way it is. As soon as we do that, we're going to stop being mindful of the people who are not here, being mindful of the community who does not know Jesus. The church is the greatest movement. Boulder Mountain's going to continue to move. We're going to make mistakes. Yes. Why? Because you have an imperfect pastor. But by God's grace, we're going to do everything we can to reach people who don't know Jesus. We're going to say to people all around the East Mesa, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have is the name of Jesus, the power and the authority of Jesus we can offer you. And it will forever change your life. I don't know what God has for Boulder Mountain, but, but we're going to keep moving forward. And, and I know it's, it's caused a whole lot of chaos. I, I think the early church experienced a whole lot of chaos early on. I've, I've talked to people who are like, hey, we need a New Testament church. I'm going to start a New Testament church. Uh, really? All those letters in the Bible were written to New Testament churches because of all their problems. <laughs> I've read recently that if Paul were alive, America would be getting a letter. Right? <laughs> the American church would be getting a letter. Absolutely. 100% true. Have you been to Beautiful? If so... Who's on your back that you're bringing to beautiful? Who are you carrying to beautiful? Jesus is the most beautiful thing you and I will ever experience. He's worth living for. I'm going to make the case he's worth dying for. Have you gone on the quest? If not, come on up front. We're going to have communion here. After communion, we're going to sing a song. I'll be down front if anybody wants to join me. Love to have that conversation with, with you introduce you to the person of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, as we enter now into a time of coming to the table, I thank you for the ninth hour. I thank you for that moment where every sin, every evil act, every, everything was paid for on the cross. And you offer us eternal life. You offer us the gift of salvation. 
As we come to the table, help us to remember the price that was paid and look forward to your coming again. Your bride, the church, we wait with great anticipation of you coming back. In Jesus' name. so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.